you're also um you also are implanting some of those gallium ions into your gold sample or your your sample whatever it is it could be many things so that's good to remember because especially um, with gallium beams you do end up with a little bit of gallium in substrate and uh, i'm going to be talking about some of the effects of that later on um, another thing that's important to remember is the redeposition process. So atoms that have been sputtered away can float away and then redeposit nearby. Um, so you're actually depositing at the same time that you're milling away materials. Um, that's definitely important to remember as you are designing your fib milling process. So fib milling at the AIF, um, we've been able to do a couple of things. And just to show you, you know, before we really dig into the details, some of the things that um, you can do with fib milling. And these are all things that I've done at NC State at the Analytical Instrumentation Facility. So you can make nano features. Here's an example. I believe these are 250 nanometer spaced features on a hexagonal lattice. Um, you can actually go quite a bit smaller than these features um, if you're using the gallium beams. Um, although this is this tends to be close to where I limit my features for other reasons. You can make micro features. Uh, this is an example of two micron spaced features, but you can go dramatically bigger than that even. Um, I personally, I believe I've gone up to 10 micron spacing for micro lenses. Um, but I don't see why you couldn't go even, even larger, especially if you're using very high currents and a plasma fib. Um, you can do hierarchical features. This is something we've done. Essentially what we did to make these is to start with micro features like you see here, and then mill nano features on top of them. And you can get some pretty cool shapes like this. Um, you can do more complex things like pyramids. Um, these are some pyramids you recently made on the gallium fib. Uh, you can do linear gratings. You can do stochastic or more random features. And you can do arbitrary features. So this is an example of when I wanted to um, pattern our, my company's logo onto a piece of diamond. Um, you can see here that you can, you can do pretty much whatever you want with um, fib milling. So one thing to consider when fib milling is your beam shape. So your ion beam might have a distribution, something like this, which means that if you're fib milling at this point where the X is, you're also fib milling a little bit close to that, and a little bit less even farther out. And the result is that if you fib a single point, you can actually get not just a single point milled. You're fibbing all around it. Um, so one thing that's often important to consider and sometimes to measure if you need very precise shape control is the beam shape and understanding how that's going to affect your final um, your final features. I'm going to show a couple examples later on where you can see the effect of the beam shape. Another thing that you really need to consider is that your sputtering rate depends on your angle of incidence. Um, so to give an example, at zero degrees angle of incidence, that means we're completely, our ion beam is completely normal to our sample. Um, you're going to have relatively low sputtering rates. And that's because any ions that are coming down um, and they're going to be likely implanted into the surface and any sputtered atoms have to come out from the sides like this. But that means that there has to be like a change in the direction of the momentum. Um, and the sputtering process is relatively inefficient here. Now, I think that's important to realize because most of the fib milling I do is at normal incidence. Um, I do occasionally do something where I tilt the sample, but most of what I do is here at zero degrees incident angle. Um, and, and so that's important to consider.
Um, when you go to a very high degree incident angle, on the other hand, you can have your ions come at your sample and sputter away atoms somewhat in the same direction that your ion beam is. So you can have very high sputtering rates if you tilt your sample, but obviously that's going to affect the final shape of your sample too, because now you're, you're milling at an angle. Um, so one way to speed up, but also complicate milling is to tilt your sample. Um, this is very important because if you are milling a feature while you're milling it, you're changing its shape. So at different points of your feature, you're actually going to have different milling rates. And so this can be extremely important when you're trying to get uh, control of your feature shapes. Um, it means that um, you can't simply just say, upload exactly the final feature shape you want as a bitmap and expect it to end up like your bitmap looks. And it's all because of this angle dependent sputtering rate. So here I show an example of, of what I was just trying to explain. So if you have a feature that you've already started milling and it has a shape like this, if you're milling here, it's the same amount of milling at this point is going to remove a little bit of material. Whereas at this point, it's going to remove a lot of material because you have this higher incidence angle right here. And as a result, even if you were to just completely mill this entire feature with the same amount of um, milling dosage, you would actually end up with a feature that is much skinnier than you started because you're gonna mill faster here and slower here, which is going to cause the feature to shrink or to get skinnier. Um, so as you can see, this can be very complicated and you have to think about this when designing your fib milling process. Another thing I mentioned that you need to consider is redeposition. Um, so when you are milling, the ejected atoms can redeposit, and they often do it in these, um, you know, these crevices where the ejected atoms can get trapped. And the deeper the crevice is, the easier it is for these atoms to get trapped. And as a result, even if you fib milled, you know, just, you know, the same milling dose for this entire, for this entire cavity, you're going to end up with something that is not got a flat bottom. In this case, it's got a curved bottom. And that's because you've redeposited features or you've redeposited your atoms. So on the right here, I show an example of if you were to scan your ion beam from left to right and slowly increase your dosage from left to right, you're going to mill something that gets deeper and deeper. But as you mill here, atoms are being ejected and they're going in all directions. But um, since your ion beam is moving to the right, anything that's ejected to the right, you're then going to mill away as your ion beam continues moving to the right. But anything ejected to the left is going to continue to be redeposited. And therefore you can end up with a very lopsided feature if you have your beam always moving in one direction. So one way to control this is by to controlling the number of passes you make. And what I mean by that is if you were to make this Y shape, for example, and just do one pass. So you, you maybe um, raster your beam left and right, and you do it one time milling at each of these points to form your Y. Um, you'll see that you end up with these um, lopsided features and all of this here, this filling of the features, um, this V shape, I guess you might call it, is due to redeposition of the ejected atoms. Now, if you were to do the same exact thing, 
But instead of dwelling for, a, in this case, 882 milliseconds and doing a single pass, you do 882 passes, each with a single uh, microsecond, excuse me, not millisecond, microsecond of dwell time, you see that you have a um, much cleaner uh, final product. You don't have the redeposition that is so dramatic over here. And that's simply because you're still having the redeposition. You do a single pass and you have one uh, microsecond worth of redeposition. But then you come back and you do that pass again. And you've, in a way, milled away all that extra stuff that you've redeposited in the previous pass. So oftentimes um, there are reasons to do single passes, but oftentimes I, I recommend trying to get at least about a hundred passes um, when you're doing a milling, unless there's a reason to do something else. And there are reasons that you might want single passes. Um, but yeah, I definitely recommend at least about a hundred passes so that you don't have dramatic redeposition problems. Um, another thing when con uh, considering redeposition is the scan path that you're using. So if you're trying to mill these holes, for example, the best way to do it might not be to raster scan. Now raster scanning is often the um, default for a lot of fibs but it's often not the best process. So if you're raster scanning, in this case, from right to left, you're going to have some redeposition in these holes. They're not going to be radially symmetric. Um, however, and you're also, you know, running the beam back and forth where it's unnecessary. So if you can control the beam path better, you can get better control of your feature shapes, you can also make the whole process a lot more efficient because you're not unnecessarily scanning this beam back and forth. So in this case, if you can control the beam such that you make a spiral for each feature and then just do a quick jump between features and do another spiral, you can get much better control of your final feature shape. You will have less problematic uh, redeposition and the process will be much faster. And so this is an example here. This is a feature that was made with a raster scan. And this is a feature that's made with a spiral scan. Now, these tilted, these top views here maybe don't make it as obvious what's happening, but if you do a cross section, you can see the difference. You can see that the profile of the features made with the raster scan is quite lopsided. And this is due to redeposition. Remember the raster scan was done from the right to the left. So you're always starting your feature on this side and then scanning the beam over to the, uh, to the left here, which means that you're constantly having redeposition on the right side. Now, if you do your spiral scans, you see that you have much um, more symmetric feature shapes. And so you can end up with a, um, a, a shape, which is likely more what you're actually desiring. And so I'll talk about in a minute, um, the difference between bitmaps and stream files, and that's a way to control your, your beam path. Um, but before I do that, I want to talk briefly about the gallium fib and the plasma fib. Um, this is particularly relevant for people who are NC State because we have both a gallium fib, which is where I'm at today, that's the quanta fib, and we have a plasma fib, which is the hydro fib. Um, the important thing is that I wouldn't say that one is better than the other. They just have different strengths. And a lot of it comes down to this figure you see here. Um, it, it says fib image resolution, but I'd like to call it instead, um, maybe your feature resolution, the, the feature resolution you can achieve um, for your, uh, when, when you're nano patterning. And then on the X or yeah, on the X axis, we've got the fib current. 
So you'll see that for lower currents, your gallium fib is got a smaller resolution, which means you can make smaller features successfully in the gallium fib, especially for lower currents. And so today on the gallium fib, for example, I'm gonna show features that are a couple hundred nanometers up to several microns. Um, you would probably not be able to make a couple hundred nanometer features on the gallium or on the plasma fib. And that's because the plasma fib has a much higher resolution meaning that it can make bigger features. Maybe your, eye, your ion beam is bigger for the gallium fib. Um, so I would say for, for smaller features, the gallium fib is more ideal than the plasma fib. However, when we go to this higher current region, you'll see that the two beams flip. Um, the gallium beam kind of shoots up very quickly, meaning that as I turn up the current, the beam size gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and I'm no longer able to make, um, like to resolve small, uh, well, I, at this point, bigger features, but I'm no longer able to resolve even the bigger features. But the plasma fib remains uh, pretty linear as we go to higher and higher currents. And this is pretty cool because that means the plasma fib, we can crank up the current, we can crank up the sputtering rate, um, and we can still maintain decent image resolution. So we can create features much quicker um, with the plasma fib. So for me personally, I like to use the gallium fib when I'm looking at smaller nanoscale features. And I really like to use the plasma fib when I'm looking at larger microscale features. Um, as I said, one isn't better than the other, but they do have different strengths. Um, here on the right, it just shows some examples of this. So you'll see that the sputtering rate um, is, they're comparable for xenon, which is gonna be your plasma fib, and gallium, which is your, well, is the gallium fib I'm at. Um, it is a little bit higher for xenon, but we're, we're talking the same order of magnitude. Um, I think what's interesting here, though, is the maximum current for the xenon or the plasma fib is dramatically higher than the maximum current for the gallium fib. And you can trust that at that maximum current, you're going to have a relatively small beam size. So you can really crank up the current and really sputter away a lot of material very quickly. And you're not gonna sacrifice with beam size too dramatically. Um, and just to give an example, um, here I show nano features. These are nano features created at the gallium fib. These are nano features created at the plasma fib with the oxygen beam and I can very easily make 300 nanometer features. It takes about 5.4 seconds per feature um, at the gallium fib. Here, I turned the plasma fib down to the lowest current it had. And I, you can barely resolve the features. I was essentially digging a hole that had some structure to it. Um, but I'm really not able to get good resolution of my features. And even here, this was when I was trying to make 100 and, or 1,200 nanometer features. So that is um, dramatically larger than these features on the left here. So you really struggle to make small nano features on the plasma fib. Now, on the other hand, with micro features, you're going to be able to make some pretty cool stuff. So here on the left, I show uh, micro lenses made with the gallium fib. Um, on the top is, you know, shorter micro features. On the bottom is taller micro features. You'll see that I have very good shape control on the gallium fib. Um, it took about 106 seconds per feature for this particular fib. Um, when I go to higher 
um, aspect ratio, so taller features, I start to see some rippling. Um, at least that's what I call it, this rippling effect where I don't have a completely smooth surface. Now I can control that to some extent, um, but I often see that if I go for very tall features where I'm removing a lot of material in the gallium fib. Um, now you see that that is dramatically minimized when I go to the plasma fib. So when I go to the plasma fib, I can still make these features. I maybe have slightly less shape control. You see that me, these um, micro lenses are more well-defined than these micro lenses, but these micro lenses also took a little bit less time. You see that the currents for these two are also similar. And while I'm talking about these particular ones, I show also um, a same feature made with the xenon fib at the same current. And so you see that I had take about the same amount of time for these two. And I also have similar features, although the, in my case, the oxygen beam is a little better. And then the gallium beam is probably a little better even more, although it took longer. But I would say for the taller features, I do have the ability to make them much faster. So in this case, I you know, only took, what is that? About a third of the amount of time to make this feature as it took to make this feature. Because I was able to crank up the current and I was able to mill away a lot of material very quickly. Now, I personally don't like to use the xenon because for my material, which is diamond, um, you start to see really dramatic rippling, really dramatic problems when I mill away a lot of material with xenon. I would not say that that is always the case. That seems to be the case with diamond. Um, so if you have other materials that you're interested in milling, certainly try the xenon fib or um, you know, one of the other gases. Um, there's also nitrogen and argon. So um, I've played a little bit with the nitrogen. I have not yet played with the argon, but um, you know, I've heard Roberta say that it works very well. So it might be able to make similar features without this dramatic um, effect here. All right, another thing I wanna shift gears and talk about really quickly is just some, some cool work that um, a friend of ours has been doing um, with what is called an ion implantation mask. As I said earlier, um, one of the things you're doing, particularly with the gallium beam, when you fib is you're um, implanting gallium ions into the surface. So this can be done with a, a lot of materials. I'm gonna talk about it specifically for diamond, but it's actually, it can be done with silicon and several other materials, but I know it can be done with silicon. Um, and essentially what you do is you fib, oops, you fib your pattern into the surface, but you're using a very low dose. So often you're just scanning the beam in the pattern you're interested in. Um, but it's barely enough to even see that you, you've made a pattern. You're not actually milling away much material. You're just giving enough dose to implant a couple of gallium ions in the surface. And what that does is the um, implanted gallium creates a hard mask that you can then use um, in, for example, a reactive ion etching process um, to protect the underlying material while etching away anything you haven't exposed the gallium beam. Um, I think this is a pretty cool way to pattern without using a resist or anything like that. And you start with a hard mask that can withstand reactive ion etching. And um, here I show some examples. Again, this is from uh, a company called uh, Adama Innovations. And this is, uh, these are two patterns that they've made in diamond doing exactly this process. So in this case, they've exposed these checkerboards and they've exposed their logo and then done a reactive ion etch to recess everything around that. And you can see, you can make some very cool structures doing this. And 
even though this is not something I tend to do, I do think it's a very cool process that people should know about, especially since it's relevant to silicon and a lot of people are doing work with silicon. All right, so I'm gonna now switch gears a little bit and talk about some specifics of patterning with FEI or Thermo Fisher FIBS. Um, and then I'll transition into showing you guys a demo of some stuff. But um, before I jump into the demo, I wanted to show, this is what our FIB screen tends to look like. So we've got our electron image here. We've got our ion image in this quadrant, and you've got our camera um, in the chamber here. Now, often what you can do is you can go to here, which is your patterning, um, I guess your patterning tab. This is also, the, I show here the quantifib, but on the hydrofib, there's also this patterning tab. And you can create a bitmap or many other things. So I want to uh, zoom in here and you can see, um, in this case, I've created a bitmap, which is why it says bitmap here. Um, I'll also show you some stream files. And uh, there's some important parameters to consider. The first are just the size in the X and Y direction. How big is my bitmap um, in X and Y? That's going to change these dimensions. Z size is how deep, how, how, uh, yeah, how deep are you going to be patterning? Now, for what I do, that is a qualitative number. It is not a quantitative number. Um, and you'll see a little more of why that is, but just to say that even if you measure all of your fib milling rates and put them in correctly into FEI, FEI doesn't account for the dosage you have in your bitmap. For example, if you have a bitmap with um, say 200 pixels per micron and you make each pixel um, 10 nanometer depth, it's not going to mill the same amount as if you have a bitmap with 50 um, pixels per micron, because now you have a different total dosage for that particular bitmap. So, um, yeah, so I, as I said, this, this is a qualitative number for me. Higher number means I'm milling longer, lower number means I'm milling for less time. Um, Dwell time is how much time you are going to spend at each point along your bitmap. So, um, and I'll show you again what I mean by bitmap in just a second, but just know that dwell time is the amount of time I'm spending at each point. Um, here you can see the different types of um, patterns you can do. Most of you are probably familiar with, you know, cleaning cross section, regular cross section. If you've done lift outs, um, rectangle, circle, line, polygon. I think those are all pretty self-explanatory. Uh, you can create a rectangle, and it's just going to mill a rectangle. Um, nothing fancy about it. Um, the two I'm going to focus on are bitmap and stream file. So here's an example of a bitmap and the resulting pattern that I created with the bitmap. So the way the bitmaps work is where we have black, complete black, you're going to have no fib milling. Where you have complete white, you're going to have the maximum fib milling, which is your dwell time. So if you have a dwell time of 100 microseconds, um then where we have complete black and let's say in the middle of the circle is complete black we're going to have zero mill time and let's say right here on the circle is complete white you're going to have a hundred microseconds of mill time now everything that is grayscale in between black and white is going to have some um like that amount of fibbing between zero and a hundred microseconds. So the bitmaps we use um, 
tend to be zero to 255 intensity. So zero would be black, 255 would be white. Somewhere in the middle, let's say 100 is going to be gray. So your fib milling time is whatever proportion of 255 um, times your dwell time, if that makes sense. So when the quanta gets this information, it's going to scan um, in whatever direction you tell it to. So let's say we're scanning um, bottom to top, it's going to scan left, right, right, left, left, right, right, left. And at each point, it's going to say, okay, at this point I have you know, uh, a, um, a grayscale feature that is 50 out of 255. So I'm going to mill for 50 out of 255 um, times the dwell time. And then it scans over and it does the same thing um, at the next point. You can also control the number of passes this does, which I'll show you um, when I actually do the demo in a minute. Um, so it might, if you have one pass, it's just going to scan the entirety of this bitmap one time and be done. If you have 100 passes, it's going to scan the entirety of this bitmap and then repeat 99 more times. All right, so the other way to pattern is with stream files. Um, stream files are extremely powerful. Um, they're also kind of complicated and hard to use. Um, so this is an example of something I've made with a stream file. Stream files do, as I mentioned before, give you a little more control over where the beam is moving. Um, and as a result, you can better control things like redeposition and you do have slightly better control over your final feature shape. Um, I do wanna break down what a stream file is for you but I will say I tend to not use stream files um, and that's because they're not actually compatible with drift control. Um, it's an FEI bug. Um, I've talked with them many times and we have not been able to resolve it. Um, but I, I will say stream files are more powerful, but if you think you're having drifts in your beam, um, you should probably avoid them because you can't use drift control and stream files, even though it should be possible. At least on our fibs, it is not currently possible. Um, so what does all this stuff on the left mean? A stream file is just a text file. The first line um, in this case is S16, which says, tells the computer they're using a 16-bit stream file. Um, you can also use a 12-bit stream file, um, which is de uh, denotated by S. Um, the second line is the number of passes. So in this case, I'm only doing a single pass. Um, if you were to have this to be a higher number, you know, 10, it's going to run the whole file and then run it nine more times. Um, the next is the number of points in this file. So in this file, there are 49,464 points, which means that there's after this, there's that many lines um, of text. And each one of those lines of text is a, uh, well, I'll show you. Each one is a dwell time and units of 0 0.1 microseconds, and then an X and Y position. So in this case, we have a dwell time of 62.4 microseconds at a pixel that is 32,897 and 32,768. The X and Y positions for a 16-bit stream file, which is this, are zero to 65,536. So since I am somewhere in between zero well, I'm almost exactly in between zero and 65,000. It means I'm starting in the middle of the, um, the screen. So um, as you can imagine, you don't want to be putting a stream file together by hand um, because it would take forever. Um, so this is something that you can either write MATLAB script, Python script, 
um, whatever to make your stream file. There are some publicly available um, scripts out there um, to make them. Um, and I recommend doing that rather than trying to um, figure this out. Right, certainly not writing one from by hand, but uh, there are there are scripts out there that you can use to to make these. Um, so I'm going to now switch over to the other computer and start showing you some examples of this. Um, but before I do that, does anyone have any questions? All right, I guess not. But if you do, please speak up and um, I'm happy to stop. All right. I guess I need to not share my screen. Share screen. Share screen. All right, cool. Um, check, real check. Can everyone see the um, uh, SEM image or the, the FIB image? Okay, good. Thanks. Nice. All right. So here, I have the fib. Let me make sure you can. You can't actually. Can, yeah, they can't. You can't. You can't see my mouse, which is unfortunate. You can use this one on this one. Sure. All right. Maybe I'll kind of do this. Mm -hmm. Oh. All right. All right. Well, I'll be jumping between things here. Okay. So as you can see here, I've got um, the electron beam ion beam and sample. I've already set up my sample so that I am tilted at 52 degrees. Um, most of you are probably familiar with that uh, process if you've done lift out, but I have brought my sample up to the, what's it called? Eucentric. Eucentric point. Um, and I have tilted my sample at 52 degrees so that um, one, I'm looking at the same point on the sample in the electron beam and in the ion beam. And two, I am normal to my focus ion beam. As I mentioned earlier, I tend to fin mill normal to my, um, with the beam normal to my sample, although that doesn't have to be the case. All right, so the first thing I'm gonna do is go over to the fib um, patterning tab. And I'm going to say, insert a bitmap. And so to do that, I just draw a bitmap. And let's see over here so you can see my mouse. I am opening a file, which I've already made. And I want to show you guys what that, what that is, because it's a pretty basic bitmap. Are they able to see that? Uh, yes, yeah. perfect. All right, so this is a very basic bitmap. Um, it's just a grid. Um, so nothing fancy at all. And But you can do a lot of cool things with a very simple grid. All right, so I've uploaded that bitmap. You can't actually see the bitmap because it's so simple. Um, but... Uh, it's there, it's exactly what I just showed you. So what I'm doing now is I'm at a very low current. So this is only 0.1 nanoamps, 100 picoamps. I have um, this features here you see is five by five features. One, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. So I have set my X and my Y to be 20, which means five features or two microns, five features per two microns. So each feature is 400 nanometers across. And um, as I've said here, this is essentially how deep your feature is, but it's qualitative. I'm gonna put five micron depth just because I've already done this um, and I know what works. And I'm gonna put 100 microseconds of dwell time. 
And the reason I've done this, so if you go here, you've got basic, which is the screen you've already seen, X, Y, Z, dwell time. We also have the uh, total amount of time this milling process will take. In this case, it is one minute and 59 seconds. So essentially two minutes. But if you go to the advanced tab and scroll down, you'll see what I'm looking for, which is passes. And you'll see that it's 482. So I'm happy with that. I usually like to, as I said before, have at least 100 passes um, for a variety of reasons. Um, one of the main ones being redeposition. So I have 482 passes, so I'm happy with that. So I'm coming back here. You do want to make sure you're focused. I did focus this before our um, we started, but I'm gonna double check the focus. That looks pretty good. One thing I want you to see here is that as I'm zooming in and out, you see that my bitmap changes accordingly. So my X and Z size are still two microns by two microns, as if a two micron by two micron square. But as I zoom out, my square shrinks and my as you zoom in, it, it grows again. And I want you to remember that because that is not the case for screen files. And um, that can cause big problems if you're not prepared for them. So yes, for bitmaps, as you zoom in and zoom out, you're, you're, everything is adjusted. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and get this started. One thing I'm gonna do, well, okay, it's started. So it's milling right now. One thing I want to do is show you guys how you can um, watch the milling process while it happens. So if you have the electron beam or if you have the ion beam milling, you cannot use the electron beam at the same time. They'll interfere with each other. It doesn't work. But one thing you can do if you have a process and you want to see how it's developing is you can come down here on this I spy tab, make sure it's changed to on and then change your time interval. The time interval is how often it's going to stop the fib milling process and take a quick electron image so you can see what's happening. 10 seconds looks good to me. So I'm happy with this. I'm gonna come over to the electron um, window and unpause it. Now that I've done that, every 10 seconds, it's going to stop the fib milling process and take an image. So there you go, there's the first one. And you can see that the features are forming here. And I'll keep it on for the remainder of this patterning process. And you'll see that the features are gonna get deeper and deeper as we go. Um, I often do not use this if I'm doing you know, a pattern, I know how it works and I'm just trying to get something done. But if I'm trying to understand how the patterning is progressing, I will turn this on and, and watch it as it goes. It does slow things down a little bit because every 10 seconds in this case, it's going to have to stop milling, take an image and go back to milling. Um, but it is a very powerful tool. Um, you can turn this up quite dramatically too. It goes up to a minute. So um you know at that point you know you're only taking one image per minute so it's not slowing you down dramatically all right and this looks like it's almost done so we'll come over here and look at what we made all right so you can see here, we've got some nice features. And there's a couple of things I want to point out here. The first is, you guys all know that all I did was use, you know, a grid of lines, but you see that there is quite a bit of rounding of the features. And that's because the beam shape, as I mentioned before, is not just a perfect point. It, it has like a Gaussian type shape. So I've automatically gotten some, some rounding of my features. Now often that's desired, 
Um, but sometimes it's not, sometimes you don't want that rounding. And so in order to get rid of that rounding, you're going to have to lower the current even more because the lower the current is, the smaller the beam is, but also the, the less material you're going to be removing. So you might be able to get sharper features by turning down the current, but it might take 10 times as long to make the same height of features. So there's definitely a trade-off. Um, for, for me, I like the rounding of the features um, for what I'm doing, but for many people that that is not desirable. So you have to, you have to understand the trade-offs when making the decisions. Another thing I want to point out is how important it is to be in focus. So here I have the ion beam. Also, as I'm, you know, focusing this, I'm milling away my features. So you have to remember that you probably shouldn't turn the ion beam and focus it if you have your final features that you're happy with, because um, you're going to ruin them. Let's uh, just see. Okay, there's not much of a change in the amount of time I did that. But if I sit there for a long time, I really will degrade the features. But I want to show you the importance of focus by purposely defocusing things. So if I were to do the same pattern with things not focused, you're going to see that the pattern looks um, pretty different. Um, and so just like when you're using the electron beam, um, when you're using the ion beam before you do you know, important patterning, make sure your focus is spot on, make sure your stig is spot on. Um, if they're not, you're going to affect your final feature shape. So um, yeah, that's definitely important to remember. Um, you also want to make sure, you know, I'll show you what happens if your current is too high for what you're doing in a minute. Um, or if your current is too low. Um, yeah, I think those are, are both important things to remember or to be aware of. So once this is done, take a look at the disaster we've made. Oftentimes, um, especially if I'm using smaller features um, and I start with, you know, a planar surface that doesn't have a lot to focus on. Sometimes I'll have to just, uh, you know, try my best to focus, but I don't have anything to focus on. So I don't know how well my focus is. I'll make some features and they won't be great. They won't look very pretty, but it's something that I can then use to focus and then you know, I'll gradually hone in on, on good focus. And um, from there, I'll be able to make good features. All right, so let's see what happened here. All right, so this is a, for example, what might happen if your focus is off. Um, so as I said, it's very important to make sure your focus is on because since the focus is off, my beam is, you know, spread out more. Um, I'm milling even wider than I want to. I've essentially like dug a small hole that happens to have a little bit of structure at the bottom. And all I've done was change the focus there. This is the exact same bitmap, the exact same condition. So it, as I said, it's definitely important to make sure you have the right focus. All right. So now I'm going to correct my focus here and show you what happens when I am using a current that is too big or too small for the features I'm trying to make. So I'll start with making features that are too small. So for example, I'm going to go from one two by two to one by one. I remember these are five features across. So now I'm making 200 nanometer features, which I already know is too small to make with this current. If I wanted to make 200 nanometer features, I would have to turn down my current. Um, you, you see that there is quite a bit of range to turn down the current. So that's not really a problem, but I would definitely need to turn down the current if I wanted to 
uh, make 200 nanometer features. But regardless, let's see what happens when I make 200 nanometer features with a current that is too high to make 200 nanometer features. Um, I'm gonna turn down this um, Z size a little bit because I'm now milling the same number of points in a smaller area. So I'm actually going to, so I've gone from, from two by two to one by one. So I've cut my area by four. So to account for that, I'm actually gonna cut my um, depth in Z by four as well. So I started with five, so I'm gonna go to 1.25. Um, I've also therefore cut the amount of time because I'm only milling a fourth of the area. So hopefully you follow that logic there. All right, so I am refocused correctly and double check that focus. Pretty happy with that. And I'm going to start this milling process. And in 30 seconds, you'll see what happens when I make something that is too, the features are too small for my current. All right, so now you see what happens. You see that you can, um, you can uh, still make out the features, but I've mostly just dug a hole. Um, so if I wanted to make nice, well-defined features with this small, uh, with, with that are this small, I would need to turn down the current. So I'm not going to turn down the current right now, just because I have some other things I want to show you guys. But using the same bitmap, you are able to make 200 nanometer features. You would just have to turn the current down a little bit. All right. So now we're going to go in the opposite direction. Um, I'm going to, instead of making 200 or 400 nanometer features, I'm going to make two micron features. So I'm gonna do 10 by 10 now. You see that now my bitmap is huge. So I'm gonna have to zoom out a little bit and I'm gonna move down a little bit so I can get this full bitmap in. All right, now for sake of time, I'm only gonna do five microns deep, but my Bitmap is now huge. So obviously this is not going to um, make features that are as deep as all the ones I've shown you so far. So um, just be aware that these aren't going to be very deep, but this is also way too low of a current to be making features that are this large. So this is already not ideal. I'll show you what we really need to do, which is turn up the current. But what you're going to see is you're going to see that the you, you see a well-defined grid. You see very little tapering of the of the features. These are also going to be extremely short features compared to the width of the features. Um, because I'm not milling for long enough. But um, yeah, by doing this, um, I hope you see that you can get, I guess, maybe better resolution in terms of how well you're able to resolve each feature um, if you turn down the current. Although I would probably never ever fib features this large at this low of a current. Even if I wanted great resolution, I'd still probably be 10 times higher in in my current. All right, so when this is done, we'll take a look. All right, 
don't worry about all the texture here. That's because there is a gold coating on this part of the diamond. It's not actually needed for fib milling, but it happens to be there. So that's what you see here. Um, let me turn up the contrast a little bit so you can really see what's going on. As you can see, we've got this nice grid pattern that looks very similar to the bitmap I used to create this pattern. Um, but the features are one, very short, and I explained why that is. But two, you just, you have, you know, no rounding of the features. Um, so if you really, really wanted exactly this shape with no rounding of the features and you had all the time in the world, you could run this bitmap overnight and create very tall features with exactly sharp edges. Um, that's certainly an option. I do want to show you what happens when I do the same thing, but I crank up the current. So I'm going to go to, let's say five nanoamps. So I've gone from a hundred picoamps to five nanoamps. So it's a 50 X increase in current now, which means I'm going to be removing a lot more material per time. All right. So I do have to refocus because I've changed. You see, as I'm focusing, I can barely resolve the features I made previously because with this high current, you just don't have that resolution. You will also see when I'm done focusing this that I've completely degraded these features. So you look at these features here. And now that I focused with this high current, I want you to see how it changes when I unpause this. So yeah, these features have changed dramatically. Um, so again, beware now that I, you know, if you're, especially if you're cranking up the current and you're focusing, you're going to be, you know, probably ruining stuff you've already done. All right. So let's move over a little bit, find a new spot. I'm gonna move this over here. And I still have 10 by 10. I'm going to make this, let's make this about 20. Let's see what our passes are. I'm still at 500 passes or so, I'm happy with that. All right, and now I'm going to start this. So I'm doing about a two minute milling time again, but now at 50 times the current of what I did before. Um, one thing that I've, I've noticed um, for people who are interested in doing features like this, um, if you have a bitmap that works at a low current for small features, and now you say, hey, I want to make big features with the same bitmap, I'm gonna turn up my current. You can often use as a pretty good estimate for the same number of features, it's going to take about the same amount of time, regardless of size, if you have your current right. So that I've used about a two minute milling time for this, um, even though the features are dramatically bigger than the thing I milled before at a lower current, for smaller features, I should have similar feature shapes just scaled up dramatically. It's just a ballpark um, place to start, but it's definitely, you know, a good starting place if you're looking for, you know, if you're just starting out and you, you have no idea where to go, um, aim for the same amount of time. So when this is done, I'll show you what happens. Then I have two more things I want to show before finishing up. The first is I want to show um, drift control. I know a lot of people are interested in that. Um, for When I'm doing these two minute mills, it's not, it tends not to be a problem. But sometimes I do something that might take me three hours. And in that case, it can be a dramatic problem. So I want to show you how to use the the drift control, I also want to show you an example of using a stream file. 
All right. So now, oh, these features are fairly sharp. So that means, as you can see here, I have fairly sharp edges, uh, much sharper than the edges I had before, which means that if I wanted rounder edges, or if I could tolerate rounder edges, I could probably turn up the current even more than this, um, maybe to seven or 15 nanoamps and get rounder features. Some people want features with sharper edges, in which case this might be a good current to work at. So these are all things you consider when you're doing your um, optimization. Another thing you could do is instead of doing just a grid line, you could add some taper, but remember that due to the, um, due to the fib milling process being angle dependent, it's not always as simple as simply making a taper at the edge in your bitmap. Um, sometimes you just end up, you know, making not what you're aiming for. All right, so let me do two things. I'm gonna turn up the current a little more just because we can um, for our next thing. And I'm going to show you the, um, the drift control. So I'm gonna let this mill while I'm getting drift control up just to remove some of that unwanted metal on the top. So to turn on drift control, you come to the home screen, go to FEI programs, FEI company, applications, drift control. There's a couple ways to get to it. This is how I tend to. So you wanna click this drift control. It's gonna open a small window. Looks like this. I tend to move it down here, but you can do whatever you want. I'm gonna stop that. Um, first you click setup and it brings this window up that basically tells you that you need to take this and find a feature that it can track. So the way the drift control works is it's going to track a feature and um, make sure that feature is always in the same point. If, if that feature moves, it's going to adjust the beam shift for every once in a while and you'll tell it how often it's going to adjust that and then it's going to continue milling um i don't have a great feature here so i'm actually going to delete this you can either make a feature or you can find an old feature so one option would be for example to use one of these previously milled features for um your tracked feature Oftentimes, if I'm in this position where I've got something and there's not a great feature to track, this isn't great for tracking, then I will switch to spot mode. And you'll see you've got this X that you can then move around. And then I will unblock the beam. So you see beam block blank at the top. I'll unblock it. And then I'll just move this around a little bit. And as I'm doing this, it's milling wherever this spot is. And then I block it and I turn back to full frame. And you'll see that that made this little feature here. I often use something like that. Um, it's kind of a quick and easy way to make something to track. All right, here we go. So now I'll go back to setup. It gives me this box. I say, here's my feature, please track this. And okay. If you go to default, it's gonna tell you what it does. So right now, I'm gonna have it correct every 30 seconds for 120 times. And after that, I still want it to correct every 30 seconds. Um, and I'm gonna click save. Now, oftentimes if I'm doing, so there you go, that's, that's what I changed it to. Oftentimes, if I'm doing a long, say, three-hour process, I only have it checked like every two to five minutes. Um, but just so you guys can see it in action, I'm actually going to do it every 30 seconds, although I think that's excessive. That's not really needed. All right. So then I click Start Stop. You'll see it go green. 
and you'll see that it takes an image. And now, once this is started, every 30 seconds, whether I'm milling or not, it's going to take a fib image and it's going to adjust the position of the fib beam so that this feature is in the place I put it. So with that in mind, I'm gonna go ahead and get this started. I, all I've done is turned up the current a little bit. Otherwise it's the same as the previous feature. And we'll see after some time, there it goes. So it took an image, it repositioned and it started milling again. And it'll do that every 30 seconds until this milling is done. This is um, very helpful, as I said, if you're doing 30 minute, I, I kind of start using drip control when it's 20 or 30 minutes or longer. Um, it's just a ballpark figure. Some days things seem driftier than others. So then I might use um, drift control more liberally if it's a very drifty day. But um, it's definitely a powerful tool, especially if you're trying to do nanoscale features. Um, you know, maybe you're trying to do 200 nanometer features and it, you're going to take an hour. There's definitely, the beam is definitely going to drift you know, enough to, to notice that 200 nanometer features, you, you might just smear the whole thing out in two hours. So, um, yeah, it's definitely, um, a powerful tool to use. Um, and it, it really doesn't dramatically affect anything else in the process. One, one other nice thing is you can see it developing in the fib here. Because you can see as I'm fibbing how the top of the features look. And when I'm done with these features, they should look pretty close to the features you see here, which were done at a slightly lower current because they only turned up the current a little bit and went from five nanoamps to seven nanoamps. So we might see a little more rounding of the features, but it's probably not going to be dramatic. All right. I do tend to like to stop the drift control before going over to the electron beam again, because it'll keep trying to um, update the fib beam and then like kick you off of the electron beam. It's kind of annoying. So once my milling is done, I do manually stop that. And here we go. So as you can see, we do have features. There are one slightly taller because I turned up the current and didn't change the milling depth. And two, um, slightly more rounded than before, which is to be expected. That's from the change in current, not from the use of drift control. Drift control won't dramatically affect anything um, about feature shape. All right. So the last thing I'm gonna show you guys um, is stream files. To do that, I'm gonna turn the current down to one nanoamp just because the stream file I have was made for one nanoamp. I'm gonna delete my um, bitmap here. Um, after you use drift control, you are gonna to have to change the um, mode back to live because drift control automatically switches to integrate. So you always have to remember that. Okay, so we're back at one nanoamp. I'm gonna get focused. Since I changed my current, I've got to refocus. All right. I'm gonna turn off drift control because as I mentioned before, drift control does not work with stream files. Um, it's an unfortunate bug, but you can't use drift control with stream files. Um, even though it should be theoretically possible. Um, 
All right, so I've got here my stream file. I wanna show you what the stream file actually looks like. So this is the stream file I'm using. As you can see, it's a very long text file. In this case, I'm doing two passes um, and there's almost 1600 points per pass. So I'm going to upload that stream file. And all this is, is I made it go in a spiral and mill less in the center and more on the outside to form what is approximately a paraboloid. So I'm gonna go ahead and get this started. While it's running, you can kind of see it starting at spiral. While it's running, I wanna show you, this is the bitmap that's equivalent to the stream file. So it's fibbing less in the center where it's dark and more on the edges where it's light. Um, but I'm also going to show you what happens when you fib with that stream with that bitmap and you'll see that it looks dramatically different than fibbing with this stream file. And a lot of that's just due to what you get from shape control. All right. So there you go. We have a nice paraboloid type thing that doesn't look so different than the profile in that um, in that uh, bitmap I showed you. There is a little bit of wonkiness here. I don't know exactly what is causing that at the moment. Maybe that's some minor amount of drift, although it was pretty quick, so probably not. I didn't optimize that stream file. Maybe it's just something funky with that stream file. Um, regardless, I want to now show you, oh, I'm going to bring that stream file back real quick because I want to show you a very important feature. Um, when I do my stream files, as I zoom in and zoom out, it does not change um size unlike the bitmaps and that can get you into big trouble because if you make a feature here it's going to be dramatically different than if you make a feature here because the size has changed so that is definitely something to consider when um when making this. And in fact, I kind of made it, made a mistake here. Um, I had made this bit, this stream file to work when the distance across this, um, the HFW, I'm actually not sure what that stands for, the something width. Yeah. Um, horizontal full width, horizontal full width. So yeah, when this, is 18.6 microns. And I actually did it when we were out here. So um, it's not gonna dramatically change things, but this is the correct way to do this particular stream file. Um, so stream files can definitely get you in trouble because it's literally just an X and Y coordinate. Um, it's not a position on your sample. It's an X, Y coordinate. And since as you zoom in and out, the x y coordinate is is constant but the position on your sample changes um it can definitely affect things so stream files are very powerful but they can also get you in trouble a little bit and you can't use drift control all right so you'll see that the same essentially the same feature was made but it will probably be a little bit deeper because we've done the same dose per area and a little bit um, smaller in, in width. And you see that indeed that's the case. So before I move on, 
Well, before I finish up, I do want to show you what the exact same thing looks like if I do a bitmap. Um, and you'll see that I'm going to do. So I know I said I always like to do hundreds of passes, and then I just did a one pass or a two pass um, stream file. So with stream files, I feel very differently. With stream files, you're doing this spiral. You're very carefully controlling your um, milling point by point. So sometimes with stream files, you actually want fewer passes. Um, so to be exactly the same, I'm gonna do, if it will allow me, I'm not sure it will. Um, Let's see. All right, that's pretty close. Um, I think it was 49 seconds. Let's see if we can get, okay, 48 seconds. So we're very close now. So two passes over 48 seconds. I'm gonna get this started. Um, but instead of going in a spiral, we're, we're the stream file and the bitmap I'm running right now are going to mill everywhere the same amount of time total but it's doing it in a different order so the stream file did a spiral from the center out and the file i'm running right now is doing bottom to tops uh serpentine so it's going left to right right to left left to right right to left left to right right to left um on its way up and I just wanted to show you the difference between running a stream file with that better control and a bitmap that is not going to have that type of control. And you see that there is a dramatic difference, even though I actually milled the same amount of time in every place. So you see, I've got a lot of um, redeposition going on because instead of going center to out and like, removing that redeposition as I go out. It's redepositing here. We've got a much like skinnier looking feature. It's just not as good control. Um, so especially if you're doing circular features and you don't need drift control, um, or if you have a non FEI one that can do drift control with stream files, um, by all means do stream files. They're very powerful, um, very useful. Um, especially when you want good shape control of larger features, but, um, you know, just be aware that even though there is a dramatic change between these two, even though, you know, both ones had the same amount of milling time at each point in the feature. So I think that's the last thing I wanted to show you guys. Um, if anyone has any questions or wants me to demo anything else, I'm happy to do it. Um, but if not, you know, thanks for coming on. It's nice to share some of the cool things we're doing here.